Hi, my name is Ken Heidebrook. My heart's desire here at Hanging On His Words is to spread the entirety of the gospel message to whoever will hear it and to serve my Creator by helping people learn how to be obediently in covenant with Him. Hanging On His Words is a ministry that not only teaches others how to run this faith race, but does so through compelling video and musical content. If you are someone that has personally been blessed by my music or video teachings or both, please consider contributing to my efforts. My goals are to step up my music and video production value, and more importantly, to create content on a more frequent and full-time basis. This is where you, you, yes, you, my patrons can make this possible. Whether your support is financial or through prayers and encouragement, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Adam and Eve introduced sin into the world, and their act removed our ability to walk around unrestricted. No need to worry, though. Hanging on his words has got you covered. Literally. Find a link in the video description. In this video, we're talking about... Last time at the first debate, we had millions of people uh, fact-checking. Uh, our goal is to offer a platform for all ideas. I'll be like, wait, I was talking. Do not interrupt me. Uh, I'd rather not say, but the answer is yes. <laughs> Good evening. You are watching Honor of Kings, season number three. This is episode 14 here at Hanging on His Words. My name is Ken Heidebrick. I'm the host of this channel. And uh, this evening I have my amazing friend who hails out of Kingdom and Context, Sean Griffin. Hello, brother. How are you doing? Hey, Ken. What's up? Thanks for having me again this week. I'm excited yep. to dig into Job. Of course, right? Job. What, what, isn't this show all about digging into the extra biblical text, you know, what we call the Apocrypha, the Deuterocanonical books, the uh, pseudepigraphal books? Job is a canonical book, right? And, and yeah. practically every single canon that's out there. So what's what's the deal? Why are we even thinking about touching this book tonight, Sean? Well, this, this book, amongst a few others that have been accepted into most canons, have vast differences between the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek Septuagint text. So since those two texts were written by different people at different points in history, we thought it fair to compare the two. Yeah, exactly. So I think tonight's episode will be um, accepted a lot more easily by people who may not want to kind of inquire or endeavor down you know, the road of extra biblical books because many people are Bible students, right, Sean? And they're familiar with the different translations and just kind of like the historicity of where we got our scriptures from, right? So looking into the Greek Septuagint and uh, the Masoretic texts isn't that, you know, conspiratorial or or even just daunting to them, right? So I think people will will be a lot more privy to wanting to watch something like this tonight. And so I hope that's the case. I hope people are interested in it, but I hate to break your... If you think that this isn't going to be, uh, you know, a little revealing, then I think you got another thing coming because there are some major differences between the two texts so i think uh i think that either way people need to stick around because it's going to be fascinating some of the things they're going to be talking about tonight 
It really is. And on that note, if you think that this show is exciting and fascinating as a concept and you enjoy what we do, please hit that that heart button, hit that thumbs up. Be sure to share or shine this to the appropriate social medias that you use. This helps us get around the algorithm of suppression that is against content like this from companies like YouTube, like you're watching on right now. Yeah. Now there's, there's other social medias coming like Lighthouse that won't suppress it. But currently until that happens, we're using other, other uh, companies like, like YouTube and they do suppress content like this. So please help us spread the word, uh, hit the like button, share on your socials. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So the share, the share and shine, that's, I mean, this is verbiage that will be on the platform that Sean just talked about lighthouse. So we're going to have to start getting used to that because that's going to be the new thing. Once this platform comes up and we start, you know, piling onto it, we're going to have to start learning to, to use the lingo that they, that they have on their, their platform. So I'm excited for it. Um, all right. So what do we do here, Sean? Just a quick synopsis as to what this show is all about for those who may be new here. Sean and I, we've been studying the scriptures for many years, and um, a lot of the the extra biblical books or the apocryphal books, sometimes they're termed, um, have been part of our studies over the years. And so we've been interested in seeing why certain canons throughout history have had some of these books that you see on your screen here, why some haven't, you know, why were some of them removed as they were, and why were some of them kept, or or why do them wait, why do they still remain? And so we've we've taken it upon ourselves to study these books, test them, and we we wanted to make a show out of it and just bring it to other people who might be interested in, in doing the exact same thing. So that's kind of the premise of what we do here at Honor of Kings. We're in our third season, as I said earlier, and we are just blessed and excited to be able to do this uh, while we still can. So, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. We've went through quite a few books. We've got quite a few more to still get through. And some of the books we have to get through, Ken, are so big, it's going to take us several, several episodes. Kind of like we've done, what, 14 episodes on the book of Enoch and we're yeah. still not done with it. You know, it's yeah, just so massive. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we're a lot of people ask us, we, on a weekly basis, we get the question, Ken, are you guys going to cover Jasher? Yes, we're going to cover Jasher <laughs> because of the nature of the book and the size of the book. It's kind of a, uh, it's a challenge for us because you know, it's, it's like a quarter of the Bible in size. It's huge. It's, it's huge. Yes. Protestant canon Bible. It's huge. <laughs> it's a big book with a lot of chapters and a lot of a lot of claims within each chapter. So uh, we want to do it justice, but uh, we and we will start to tackle that in season three of Honor Kings. So stick around. Be sure to subscribe. Don't miss yeah. the new episodes. Absolutely. All right. So this episode, we're going to be jumping into the book of Job, as we said, and there's some really fascinating differences between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. So before we even delve into this i think it's fair or at least responsible for us to discuss what is the masoretic text and what is the septuagint you know why why are we even bringing these two texts up sean yeah. what you want to start with talking about sure. the historicity yeah sure uh, i think the biggest thing that i i think people should remember is that you know the bible that we have today is at you know at the end of a long process of translations from different languages and so even though the English Bible is probably the most distributed version of translation across the world, it's not the originals by far. There's hundreds of years of other languages translated of, of Bible translations before it um, going back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back in the third century BC, so approximately 260 years before Christ, you had King of Egypt. His name was Ptolemy II, Philadelphus. He specifically commissioned 70 Hebrew scholars. Um, some people say 72, some people say 70, but approximately 70 Hebrew scholars he commissioned to translate from the Hebrew of that day, which as far as I understand would be a mix of Aramaic and Paleo-Hebrew. They, they would translate the scriptures that they had at that time of the, uh, of the, the first were the first five books, you know, Genesis through, supposedly it was Genesis through Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. They translated those into the Greek from that, their Hebrew of that day. And then about a hundred years later, they had the rest of the Old Testament translated into Greek as well. So by the time we get to the days of Yeshua in the New Testament and the disciples, they're all quoting from a Greek Septuagint version of the scriptures because Greek was the common language, not just of the world, but specifically of that region. It was the language of business and commerce because the Greeks had taken over everything um, a, a couple hundred years earlier. So you go back and study the days of Alexander the Great, as well as the Maccabees. Okay, so the Greeks, they ruled everything before the Romans started to take over. 
So Greek was still the language of the day, and that's why they had this prevalent text, this translation from, from Greek uh, that they all read and understood. In fact, Ken, if you even see in the book of Acts, Paul, he speaks to a large crowd in Greek, and then in one moment, this is in Acts 22, and then he asks him, do you guys understand Hebrew? So then he starts speaking both in Greek and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. This is how common it was, guys. It was the common language of the day, and Latin was a part of it as well. Latin was uh, starting to be used because the Romans used Latin, so this is where Latin became more prevalent over time, which is why we get to approximately the 3rd century A.D., where there were by that time there were multiple versions of the Septuagint, and some of them were being put into Latin. Yeah, so and that's, this, that's actually the, the word Septuagint is a Latin word, right? It's derived yeah. from the Latin for Septuaginta. So yes, yeah, yeah exactly. So um, that's where the little brief, and that's a super brief history, guys, on the on the Septuagint translation. But flash forward seven hundred years after that, till around the late eighth and early ninth century A.D., you had rabbinic Pharisees decided to take the modern Hebrew that they spoke at that time and create a, uh, a Hebrew version of from the Septuagint because they didn't like the Septuagint. So they wanted to create a Hebrew version again. And that is where we get the Masoretic text from which 99% of our English translations were translated today. Right. So if there's a hundred translations out there, most of them will come from the, the Masoretic text and very few of them will come from the actual Septuagint text. Yeah. And Both some of them, them do fix them, right? Some of them do. Yeah. Some of them actually do. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's actually kind of a clever way of getting around some of the copyright in my opinion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because if you have to have certain differences in order to have a new translation of the Bible, according to today's copyright laws. So this is why it's not, it's not a black and white situation. Okay. Guys that we were trying to be as fair and as uh, scholastically accurate as possible while not making your eyes go, go back of your head because you, because it's so boring. So essentially the text themselves, um, we're, we're going to be dealing with the prominent Greek translated text and the, the Masoretic text is the one we have today. Both have been translated into English for us. And so we're going to be comparing where those two different translations set and how much differences there are, because there are quite distinct differences. It's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And as you said, Sean, I mean, uh, our Protestant canon, which is what we have, right? The 66 books, the Old Testament Protestant canon um, is derived from judaism's canon that's right. that's they adhere to that which is interesting to me because i mean the rabbis themselves state today and have historically said that they've wanted to distinguish their tradition from the emerging tradition of christianity right which frequents which frequently use the the uh, subtusion so it's like to me it's like okay they're admitting that they want to not have any type of correspondence or or you know, you know what i mean with christianity so they wanted to get away from that lingo and anything to do with that and create their own and our modern versions for the most part because a lot of our our churches and denominations stem from protestantism which comes from catholicism or a break away apparently from it right. and we're deriving our our bibles our canons our our authority that we've placed upon these rabbis based off of their admission of saying that they've wanted to create something based off of an emergence from Christianity because they didn't like it. Right. So to me, that's like, oh, okay, that doesn't make sense because we are Christians, right? We're people who believe in Yeshua and the apostles and, and the letters that they wrote and, and everything that they endured, right? And we believe their words, their writings. And it's just, to me, it's fascinating that we, we would place so much emphasis on on the rabbis and their authority over over something like you know what i just described that they, they didn't want to have anything to do with the emerging christianity and, and the fact yeah. that they used the septuagint you know paul using the septuagint right. um yeshua using the septuagint all of them using the septuagint so it's like to me that's a home run case to you know look a little bit more into the septuagint you know what yeah I mean? take definitely take it seriously because there's a lot of anti-missionaries people that um, are a part of judaism uh, that try to sway people away from belief in yeshua by taking some of the quotes from the new testament by yeshua himself or by the apostles and saying see he's misquoting the prophets well that's because they're going off of the masoretic translation and not the and not the greek septuagint so this is why they'll say they'll pull specific passages and they'll say well look he's misquoting well this is this is very dishonest to the historical nature of the texts but right. this is what they do to try to get people to lose their faith so um yeah, this is this is why it is important to take the Septuagint seriously. Uh, we at least we believe, and that's why we're going to study it in front of you today.
All right. Okay, so before we we get actually into it, guys, we just Sean and I thought it would be best if you have any questions, um, we'll just take them along the way. We'll we'll kind of scour through the the uh, the live chat there, mm -hmm. and if you guys have any questions as we go over each discrepancy between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, put it in all caps. Let us you know. Let us know what you're thinking. If you have anything you know on your hearts, on your minds, you want us to address, we'll try to get to it. But we're going to try to make a flow through this because we have several texts to actually cover. So this might turn into a, a two-part, possibly even a three-part, you know, mini-series here in the Book of Job. But uh, yes, if you have any questions, put them in all caps. Well, we already got a question, Ken. It's <laughs> I'm just putting this up for fun, though. But Dave <laughs> Dave Lewis is asking at some point, could you get a hold of a Gias Bible from Ethiopia and work with that and teach us and compare with that, brother? That we would love to. If you, you know, this is actually on our hearts for the future to actually do, um, you know, an actual documentary in Ethiopia and speak with Ethiopian Levite priests that are still active today um, and have them, you know, go line by line with us over some of these texts. But just finding that that connection and that, per I mean, I tried to reach out to Ethiopian churches in the Denver and the Fort Collins area when I used to live in that area um, in Colorado, because they're, they're, Denver is actually a, a refugee city for Etrians and Ethiopians. So there's a lot of them there. And I tried to reach out to them. I, I got no responses from anybody of all the different churches I called and tried to reach out to. So okay. um, making that connection to make that friendship so they trust you to talk about their language and their text about some of these controversial issues um, is, is, is our prayer. So, yeah. yeah. We would love to do that in the future, but it's just as apparently it's going to be on the father's time. So yeah, exactly. Okay. So Donna Flinch is asking in the comments, which version of the Septuagint will you be using tonight? Sean, are we going through the Brentons? Is that what we have up on the screen? Yeah. That's the one that is most readily available for anyone to follow along and read with us. It's on Bible gateway, Bible hub. Um, it's on a bunch of different online free resources for you to look at um, and to test for yourself. I know that Ken has a special version, but not everybody yeah, I, has that one. I personally, I've, I've read parts of uh, the new English translation, which is one of the more prominent ones and quite a bit of Brenton's, but I, I have the Lex, Lexham English Septuagint, which to me, it's just slightly surfaces over the other ones. Um, I won't get into that, but it's a good translation. They're all really good translations. It's just that uh, I, I tend to favor the Lexingham. I would I would lovingly disagree. I don't like the NET, the New English translation uh, of the yeah. Septuagint. I think that's it, true. It's not. I think it's, it's, it's it very rarely do I say this about our translations, uh, but the NIV and the New English translation of Septuagint, those are trash. <laughs> so, in my opinion, in my opinion, they, yeah, they do. You can have it. That, that was my first uh, yeah. book of the Septuagint. Like when I was studying it years ago and I, yeah. I realized that the New Testament quoted from the Septuagint and I was wondering why that was. That was yeah. the first book I got. So to me, that's like, it's a good entryway into it, but there are better. I agree with Sean. Yeah, I agree. Sure. All right, we'll All jump right. into it. Um, Job 1 5, right off the gate, first five verses. So right, I, I can read it. Okay. Or how about we do this, Sean? I'll read the, the Masoretic text. You read the Septuagint. Okay. All right. Let's just do that. Cool. All right. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Hmm. Okay. So the Septuagint says, and when the days of the of the banquet were completed, Job sent and purified them, having risen up in the morning, and offered sacrifices for them according to their number, and one calf for a sin offering for their souls. For Job said, Lest peradventure my sons have thought evil in their minds against God. Thus then Job did continually. All right. So it doesn't seem like there's a real big difference, does it? Is like when you first just kind of read it, it's like, okay, you get their sons, Job is worried that they might have sinned so he's making you know these offerings whatever but mm -hmm. you know what what stands out the most in the Septuagint version to me it's it's the this passage highlighted in yellow here for a they took a calf for a sin offering for their souls so this to me is introducing some of the features of Job's uh, responsibility over them mm -hmm. in a very specific fashion and it's not just a burnt offering that we're having here which is a it can be a vague uh, term according to how it's used but right. Specifically, it's a sin offering, right? So, 
Which is this a particular is, offering, right? It's a particular offering in, in the in the Torah in Leviticus um, that's defined with its own descriptions. So this would be done by a priest for sure. Yeah. Interesting. So this is, yeah, this gives you a little bit more grounded context to what's actually happening. Because yeah. like lots of people did open open burnt offerings in the field. This was a common practice of lots of pagan nations, but why is Job suddenly doing a sin offering to Yahweh for their souls? And that specifically matters because that terminology of for their souls, it's an atonement offering. It's not just a Thanksgiving offering, but it's an atonement offering. So, right. And so what's the big deal though, Sean? I mean, so he's doing a sin offering as a possible priest. So what? I mean, we're led to believe, right? That through kind of rabbinic tradition that the priesthood was established at Mount Sinai with Aaron. Correct. Right. The Levitical that's right. priesthood started that's right. with that's, Aaron. That's and what the are, that's what's told to us from the people that create the Masoretic text. Right. And so it's interesting because I mean, if you go back on the screen there, Sean, we brought up this kind of vague term of of offered burnt offerings. We see that a lot in the Masoretic text. It's just in, in a Genesis, Exodus. You know what I mean? When Abraham's making burnt offering, Jacob, you you could read that and just be like. Um, I don't know. I mean, he's just setting up an altar, making a burnt offering, whatever. But this sets it apart because, as you said, mm -hmm. for a sin offering for their souls, as it says in the highlighted version there, that's a very specific priestly ordinance that, yeah. yes, Aaron had to do and his sons and the Levitical priest had to do. But most scholars, um, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, placed Job pre Mount Sinai days, correct? Yes. And actually, we're going to show that by the time we get to the end of this comparison. Right. We're, we're going to prove that with scripture. So not just, not just our opinions, guys, like undeniable word for word. We're going to show you from the scriptures and even from Genesis. Right. So stick with us. It's going to get fun guys. All right. All right. So the next one here is uh, Job two nine. Then said his wife unto him, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Okay. So the Septuagint has a little more to say for this verse. And it says, and when much time had passed, his wife said to him, how long will you hold out saying, behold, I wait yet a little while expecting the hope of my deliverance for behold, your memorial is abolished from the earth. Even your sons and daughters, the pangs and pains of my womb, which I bore in vain with sorrows. And you yourself sit down to spend the nights in the open air among the corruption of worms. And I'm a wanderer and a servant from place to place and house to house, waiting for the setting of the sun that I may rest from my labors and my pangs, which now beset me, but say some word against the Lord and die. Hmm. Yeah, quite a bit <laughs> his, more there. His wife is savage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she is. And uh, okay, so I mean, there's a lot there. Obviously, that's there's a lot added there. in addition to the Masoretic text. So what, what's what's the significant part that we thought was worth highlighting? Well, this one right here is the, oh <laughs> the majority of the passage, right? <laughs> so it's like it's not just her saying, "Why are you trying to retain your integrity? You curse God and die." It's it, she's giving some back description of. You know, this is the moment where he has the sores on his body and he's sitting out in the open air, which I would imagine is because he has to kind of uh, quarantine himself for a certain amount of days because he's unclean. And um, which is another inference to applicable Torah, by the way, as well as she's extremely upset. She's talking about the death of her children and how that was all having the children was in vain. And also to the place that now she has to go get a job. Yeah. Because remember, he was extremely wealthy. Yes, he was. Yeah. We're so now how, how he acquired that wealth and, and you know, yeah. Why, What's interesting to me is this is a little bit of a parallel to what we saw with Tobit. Remember when Tobit was blinded, his wife had to go get a job mm -hmm. and yeah. she was, she was unhappy about that. Yeah, <laughs> She was. Yeah. Yeah, she and, was. So she is vocalizing her, her, you know, her distaste to have to go house to house and, and be a wanderer and a servant from place to place. But Sean, for me, that little, that little part there kind of, what is it? The just, just below halfway of there. And I am a wanderer and a servant from place to place and house to house waiting for the setting of the sun. That has significance from my understanding uh, because it actually parallels almost verbatim and um, in application in a different book that we're going to be covering next because that's right. I don't want to give anything away. Yeah, but we, we got a surprise book we're doing next. So we have a surprise book we're going to be doing after this. It's going to this episode and, and a subsequent episode is probably setting us up for it. Yeah, but we see a, it, they're actually book. doing that. Exactly, this yeah. and this is this is a surprise because you guys have never heard us talk about this book before. 
Yeah. So we're going to test something that we've never heard anyone else talk about, to be honest. So anyway, but yeah, these, this is why these two, the, uh, these, these episodes we're doing on the book of Job and the canon is important. So I agree with you, Ken. We'll keep moving real quick, unless you have okay. anything else to say. No, we can go on. Job 2.11. All right. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite, where they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And the Septuagint counters with, now his three friends, having heard of all the evil that was come upon him, came to him each from his own country, Eliphaz, the king of Tamans, Baldad, the sovereign of the Saukans, and so far, the king of the the Menaeans. And they came to him with one accord to comfort and to visit him. Okay. Right. And so we have some very, in my opinion, this is a huge discrepancy, like discrepancy or difference, whatever you want to call it. This is a huge deal. Yeah. The, it, it's a, it's weird why this would be left out in the Masoretic text because, I mean, why wouldn't you put, you know, that these guys were kings right. from their own countries, right? Well, to me, you would want to scrub that out because not not just anyone gets a visit from three kings that's right right? i mean the fact that these guys are kings of country uh shows their power their their influence the fact that you know job isn't just some random rich guy as we're going to find out later on and and moving forward but these are just details that i think we need to know because it it tells us who job actually is yeah he's a man of prominence and it's not just because he was wealthy yeah so yeah, this is all important details. We're we're truce loosen right now, bro. <laughs> all right, Job 4.12 in Masoretic. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof. The Septuagint counters with, but if there had been a truth in your words, none of these evils would have befallen you. Shall not mine ear receive excellent revelations from him? Hmm. Okay. So the the reason why I put in parentheses here that the, the actual context as far as receiving revelations from him, it goes back to Job 4, 9 in the Septuagint, which tells you directly they're speaking about uh, Yahweh. They're speaking about the Almighty. Right. So this is not just, it's, it's very hard to tell uh, in Job 4, 12 and the Masoretic text what's going on. But not only does it use the word him in Job 4, 12, but it, it's actually talking about receiving information from him. Um, yeah, and, and specifically revelations. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's. I mean, so I can't recall. Was this this was um, one of the kings, right? This isn't Job himself here, is it? Yeah, this is uh, Eliphaz, the right. from uh, the Taman, for the king of Taman, or also in the Masoretic text, you would call him uh, Eliphaz, the king of the Temanite. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So he's talking. So the point would be, he's claiming that he can actually receive you know, speaking in revelation from God to him too. Mm-hmm. So why would, why would that be a point of contention that you would want to leave out of the yeah, Masoretic text? That's, that's interesting. Why would you want to change that? You'd want to probably change that because no one, but the Jews can claim to be, you know, sons of God, right. In the family of God. I still hear it today, brother. I still hear it from people that ascribe to Judaism and that are very sympathetic toward modern day Judaism, they even in Torah Zurich community circles, they still quote the phrase, but don't you know, Sean, that the oracles were given to the Jews, like Paul says. Right. In Romans chapter, was it Romans chapter two? And I'm like, yes, 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 they were, but it's not the only person. Like even in the canon in Numbers 24, Balaam from the Midianites received a word from the Lord. You know what I'm saying? And visitation of an angel, even, yes, it was in correction, but if you read the entire story from chapter 22 to 24 of the book of Numbers, Balaam who was not an Israelite, um, he received revelation from the Lord as well. And he even prophesied favorably over Israel, even about the last days, even about the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is a cultural bias that we've seen. It's also in the book of Acts chapter 10, where uh, we see the same type of cultural bias that that, um, Peter is being reprimanded for having um, when he is being told by angelic visitation that he gets his vision to not consider someone that God has made clean as unclean, which is what Peter was doing towards Gentile nations. This is a, this is internal prejudice and bias that is built inside of Judaism. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I mean, a lot of it is also predicated upon Genesis 49, 10, right? Where the the scepter will not depart from Judah or the, you know, 
ruler staff from between his feet or the lawgiver between his feet or however that goes. They think that that's, there you go, Judah, the Jews, therefore they have, you know, prominence over and Yeah. Yeah. They use that as a supporting passage for their theories. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, if I was a, a, a rabbi in the, in the eighth and ninth century, and I had this mindset of prejudice because I was raised in Judaism, I would also, I wouldn't be happy with this guy named Eliphaz, who's not of the descendancy of Abraham that we can tell from the scriptures and from, you know, coming up to Job, who's also a king. Uh, I wouldn't, this King Eliphaz, I would not like it that he claims to be in receiving revelations from the almighty. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're going to so, find out he's a king, right? Coming up. No, we found that out in the previous, previous passage. We did that one. Uh, right? oh. Eliphaz, the king of the. Oh the yeah. Mind. Okay. I yeah. thought you said, I thought you said Job. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. So Job 522. All right. At destruction and famine, you shall laugh. Neither shall you be afraid of the beasts of the earth. Hmm. The Septuagint pairs with you shall laugh at unrighteous, at the unrighteous and the lawless. You shall not be afraid of wild beasts. All right. So once again, we want to highlight this verbiage of unrighteousness and yeah. lawlessness. I mean, there's, as Sean's done videos, I've discussed things on my channel about these words having definitions found in the scriptures. You can't, they're not malleable. Right. right. You can't just they have meaning based off of where they're found in the scripture. That's how you define certain words. And so when he's bringing up your unrighteous and the lawless, I mean, in order for someone to be lawless, there has to be a law. So which law is this talking about, Sean? Exactly. Same thing with righteousness. In order to be righteous, there's only one definition of righteous in scripture, and that's you're doing the commandments of Yahweh. Right. And and for you know, the passerby who may not see the relevance of why we would bring that up, it's because Judaism who solely adheres to the Masoretic version that they created back in the 7th to 10th century, says that the law of God only began through mm -hmm. Moses at Mount Sinai and was given to Israel there. Right. And keep in mind, most scholars believe this book of Job predates any any angelic interaction on Mount Sinai during the days of Moses and the Exodus. So, Yeah, in the canon of 66, most scholars think that Job is, is the actual earliest book that we have. So it would... And we're not talking about the content within the story. We're talking about when it was actually supposedly penned and written. Specifically, right. if it's a true testament of Job's life, uh, Job, Job being a contemporary uh, between Abraham and Moses. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, um, we'll go on to the next one real quick. Job 12, 18 and 19. Okay. He loosens the bond of kings and girds their loins with a girdle. He leads princes away spoiled and overthrows the mighty. Septuagint compares that with he seats kings upon thrones and girds their loins with a girdle. He sends away priests into captivity and overthrows the mighty ones of the earth. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Pretty, pretty interesting differences. So the first part, Sean, mm -hmm. he seats kings upon thrones versus he loosens the bond of kings. Yes. It's okay. kind of like two opposite things in my opinion. Yeah. That's how <laughs> I read it. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. Is that my incorrect? Are we incorrect with how we're we're understanding this here? Nope. That's okay. that to me, to me, that seems like two completely opposite things, you know. And this is actually Job talking, by the way, in this mm -hmm. in chapter 12. So yeah. Yeah. So that's two different things. I, you know, if you if you didn't want people to um if you didn't want people to know about you know that the father would be involved with the other kings and their appointments in other city in other countries. Uh, other nations, just like the previous passage where it said that even those kings receive revelation from the Almighty, then yeah, you wouldn't, you would, you would change the wording. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So this is an Ms. interesting one. Absolutely. Miss Winfeather says wording is so imperative and can change your perception on something if it's worded wrongly and with misplaced punctuation. That is so true. That's so true. Yeah. All right. The second part here, Sean, he sends away priests into captivity. Why, why we got that highlighted? Well, it's uh he the, the Masoretic says he leads princes away spoiled, whereas the Septuagint says he sends away priests into captivity, which right. I think that that's really interesting because um, the the priesthood was prophesied to be uh, corrupted, and the sole reason that Israel goes into captivity amongst the nations, um, and that's all the way back to the Testament of twelve patriarchs in multiple places. One of the most prominent places is the Testament of Levi but it's also supposedly prophesied in the book of Enoch as well. Um, 
according to the Testament of Levi. And it's very interesting that this is the shame, if you will. This is this is what the Testament of, I think it's the Testament of Dan, um, or it, or it's the Testament of Benjamin in the, in the Testament of 12 Patriarchs. Benjamin. It talks about, yeah, it talks about how the priests, that they are a part of the corruption, that they betray the righteous one, which is the son of God. And then that's, this is why um, the, the veil will be torn. Right. Uh, over yeah. the over the Holy of Holies, because it shows their shame and their nakedness, their lawlessness. Right. There's so many theories about why that veil tore the way it did. Right. And it's yeah. just testament of the 12 patriarchs will tell you something yeah. that was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. It'll tell you exactly why that why that was. Yeah, it's pretty okay. wild. But right now, Ken, real quick, we'll go to a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. Sounds good. Adam and Eve introduced sin into the world and their act removed our ability to walk around unrestricted. No need to worry though. Hanging on his words has got you covered. Literally. Find a link in the video description. All right, welcome back. You are watching Honor of Kings. Sean and I are currently sleuthing our way through the book of Job, comparing the different versions of the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. We're only, what are we at now? Chapter 12, Sean, and we've we've covered quite a few huge discrepancies that could alter someone's perception about what's really taking place and what's being said in this book, eh? Yeah, that's right. There's yeah. there's quite a few. In fact, we have a, a quick question here in the chat. Uh, looks like Chico1985 is asking, why are there so many different translations? I mean, that's, that's a big question, but a lot of it has to do with copywriting. There's copywriting mm -hmm. issues that... Uh, us modern individuals have to deal with because we don't want to get sued. We don't want to plagiarize. We don't want to do all these things that publishing companies require you to do, right? So that's why, and unfortunately, it changes, it can change the meaning of text. I mean, I've seen it. Sean brought yeah. up a, a version like the NIV, not a very good version. They, they, they've copyrighted in a way where it's just, I don't yeah. know, it's, it's a little a little loose on things, but well, there exactly everything Ken said, and I'll add to it a little bit with two other points. One is the, the financial incentive. Uh, the Bible is the most sold book in the world. You'll, you have to dig to find that information. But um, in fact, it was, it was amongst publishers. It was stated that they, they was going, they were going to stop putting the Bible on the New York times bestselling list because it outsold every other autobiography or biography or fictional novel it outsold all those other books so far uh, uh, by number of copies that it was dwarfing all other book sales every year across the world. Mm -hmm. They just don't even include it in the category of the New York Times bestsellers list anymore. It literally hundreds of millions of dollars every year of Bible Bibles being purchased and shared and bought for other people and that kind of stuff. So, and th it's a huge money game for people to get in there and actually get scholars to get together with these texts and create a new translation that, can pass the muster, you know, but stay within the, the guidelines of copyright because it, I mean, it, it could equal to them millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and not to mention that there's, you know, there's texts that surface throughout time, right? That they, they have to yep. uh, look at, compare because, you know, like as we move forward in time, manuscripts get copied certain ways and, and uh, you know, they, they change, they can be tampered with. So, new information that arises through archaeology and and you know people going out there trying to find these things um they'll find new newer vert like older texts that surpass some of the newer texts mm -hmm. or earlier dated texts rather than the older dated texts and it, they'll have to change things up in the translation to make it slightly more accurate now with that said though it doesn't mean that the 1976 version of the kgv or the new american standard is inaccurate yeah. these are slight minute differences guys the overall themes and context of the scriptures is accurate in all these translations. There's, there's not a Bible translation out there that says Jesus didn't go to the cross and isn't your savior. Yeah. So the big ideas, the big themes, the big concepts, Abraham's a patriarch, Noah got on the boat. King David was, was the anointed King of, of, of Israel after Saul, you know, Isaiah was a prophet, uh, you know, all the big concepts, they're still in there. Mm -hmm. There's still 12 disciples. Judas was still the one that betrayed him. Like all these concepts are still in all these translations. These are minute textual criticism differences, but those little minute differences can add up to a point where it fulfills the requirements for copyright and they can create a separate translation. And that's what they do. Right. So yeah. this is, this is why it's a, it's a very coveted money game for a lot of these people. 
Yeah, totally. Yeah. All, All right. right so on. the next one I think was Jeb 19.9. Okay. Masoretic Tech says, he has stripped my honor from me and removed the crown from my head. The Septuagint compares with, and he has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. Okay. So as Sean has shown on the screen, they're similar. They're very these are, similar. These are similar. And this is why if you're reading, like this is chapter 19 of a book with 42 chapters in it. Look at all the differences we've already shown you in the previous 18 chapters. So if you're reading the Masoretic text and you miss the part where he's doing a specific sin sacrifice in chapter one, you miss the part in chapter two where he's following the Torah to quarantine himself because of his boils and scabs. If you miss the idea that he has fellow kings come to visit him, that's how important he is. Then you might not realize why he would have a crown as said by the time you get to chapter 19. That's right. That's right. You could read this like I have for years mm-hmm. and not even realize he had a crown stripped from his head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, People, only certain individuals wear crowns. Yep. So yeah, this is this is a big deal. And this could be overlooked. This so this is a short one, but we just wanted to point it out because it is in both. Yeah. Job nineteen seventeen. All right. Masoretic says, My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated for the children's sake of mine own body. And the Septuagint compares with, and I besought my wife and earnestly entreated the sons of my concubines. All right. So wait a minute. I thought his children died right yeah so the septuagint claims that he had more than one wife he had concubines in addition to his wife and he had children through those concubines as well so this would be very similar to abraham or even jacob correct and those children are still alive so his actual his his direct children from his from his first wife those died but it looks like his other children are still alive mm-hmm. but no but the the surrounding context to this verse is that nobody wants to talk with him because he's he's his outward skin is gross and you know he's he's in quarantine basically because of yeah. the boils on him he's unclean so his family's not talking to him so he's emotionally troubled by this as well and 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 uh, i mean the whole concubine thing your, your average joe back in in ancient times didn't have the means and the wealth and the prestige right. and uh, you know p- position of power like job had clearly to being a king to be able to have concubines anyways right? right normally we see people in in kingly positions with concubines right so it's it's an interesting thing to exclude from the masoretic text in my opinion yep it is surely is Job, and then the same chapter we got more job 19 25 and 26 okay for i know that my redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my body sorry and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall i see god and the Septuagint compares with for i know that he is eternal who is about to deliver me and to raise up upon the earth my skin that endures these sufferings for these things have been accomplished to me of the lord Okay. <laughs> I got to tell you, Sean, honestly, I, I had a bit of a, an emotional response to, to the Masoretic version of this. I've, I've included mm-hmm. that in videos um, mm-hmm. just regarding the latter day sure. uh, mention here, right? That he shall stand at the latter day, his re- the Redeemer, right? So to me, that's referring to Yahweh or, or Yeshua. Um, and it, the whole latter day verbiage there is, is always fascinating you know i you and i love talking about the day of the lord the resurrection the return of messiah the millennial reign all that stuff right so yeah it's interesting because the septuagint you can see it in there too but it's not as straightforward like mentioning a specific term like latter day right right yeah it, it both are saying the same thing one is is uh the, you know one calls him the redeemer the other one calls him who he who is eternal will deliver me so that's mm-hmm. you know that is essentially saying the same thing as saying my redeemer lives. Um, and then one says to the latter day upon the earth to, I, that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And you're like, okay, that's cool that we know the father and the son are supposed to descend to the earth at the, at the coming of the day of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, and literally their house descends to the earth as well. So that's cool. But the Septuagint says to raise up upon the earth, my skin that endures these sufferings. So that's a mention to the resurrection, just like we see in the Septuagint, the Masoretic as well. Yeah. What I think is so uniquely different about not just the way it's worded, but the, the last passage here is that these things have been accomplished to me of the Lord. Yes. 
So this is a direct correlation to his promised resurrection being accomplished to him of the Lord and an action done specifically in his favor from the Lord to Job. Yet the other one seems like a statement of faith that yet in my flesh, I shall, I shall see God. Yeah. Which is true. Because it is true. In your immortal body, you will be able to see Yahweh. It, it is true. You're going to, whether you're resurrected in the first resurrection, the second resurrection, or you're resurrected with the wicked, you're always going to see him. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to stand before him face to face at some point. It's just how that happens is the difference. And so this is the Septuagint, in my opinion, alludes to this as being something that is done to him because it's a part of the promise of the covenant, which is the resurrection. If you follow the ways of, of Yahweh, which is what this the previous passage have shown us, Job has has in a position of already been doing that. He's already been someone that's following the ways of Yahweh. Yeah, exactly. He's yeah. he knows the law. He's a priest, right. evidently. So he's doing the law and he knows that stuff. So yeah, yeah, good. it's very interesting. And just a few verses later. Okay, so Job nineteen twenty seven Masoretic says, "Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me." And Septuagint compares it with which I am conscious of in myself, which mine eye has seen, and not another, but all have been fulfilled to me in my bosom. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So this one is a little different for. I, I think it's interesting. One seems like a statement of faith. A Masoretic seems like a statement of faith. Whom I shall see for myself, right? He's speaking. This is in the context of the previous two verses, talking about the Redeemer. Um, whereas the 27 says, which I am conscious of in myself. So this is like he's actively in faith of this, which my eye has seen. That would mean he's had revelation yeah. of his Redeemer, right? Right. Yep. Which is interesting because so did Enoch. So did Abraham. So did, you know, some of these other patriarchs, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But the Masoretic, you would, um, the Masoretic speaks of it like it's future tense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's really fascinating. Yeah. And then, um, and then I guess, and though my reins be consumed within me, I have no clue what that means. But the Septuagint says, but all has been fulfilled to me in my bosom. Yeah. I so think reins is like a, like a KJV old English. What is it talking about? Like your trousers or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. To me, it just communicates something a little bit different. Uh, but the idea of him actually already having some sort of revelation, because remember, he said previously in the previous chapter, chapter 12, that the almighty can speak to kings. Yeah, he exactly. can't have revelation to kings. And I think, you know, we're actually going to see something like that in this in this mystery text that we're going to look at in a couple of yeah. weeks. Right. Uh, uh, I'm so excited to do it for sure. So is this an allusion to that? Ken? It could be. Interesting. Well could be. Interesting. Yeah, we're gonna have to keep these these passages in the back of our mind when we cover it. Yeah, we will. Absolutely. All right. Job nineteen twenty nine. Masoretic. Be you afraid of the sword? Be you afraid of the sword? For wrath brings the punishments of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. And the Septuagint compares with, "Do you also be aware of deceit? For wrath will come upon transgressors, and then shall they know where their substance is." Okay. Mm. Wrath will come upon transgressors of what <laughs> right what are you transgressing yeah and it's it says the first one the masoretic says be afraid of the sword the septuagint says be afraid of deceit yeah the second one says punishments of the sword the second one says the wrath will come upon transgressors well deceit is someone that is walking in transgression exactly. so, I mean, so there's there's correlation there is someone that's not following the law of god of course you're going to get wrath whereas the Masoretic's too vague. I don't even know what it means. I know it is pretty vague. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any, I think we got another comment here. Which one are you looking at? Uh, oh, okay. They're, I was just looking at Dave Lewis and Chico. I think they're just proclaiming something as opposed to asking us something. Okay. Okay. All right. Moving along here. Job twenty two twenty five. Yay. The almighty shall be your defense and you shall have plenty of silver. Nice. Mm. Septuagint follows with, so the Almighty shall be your helper from enemies, and he shall bring you forth pure silver that has been tried by fire. Whoa. <laughs> right? That changes the context a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, this is different. Okay. So, yes, people can acquire wealth by keeping the commandments, doing things, silver mm -hmm. being an aspect of that wealth, which is which is interesting to me, but what is the Septuagint saying here, Sean, with this 
you'll be tried by fire and he'll bring you forth pure as silver. That's that sounds very reminiscent of what I've heard almost in the New Testament. That's right. Yeah, this is a, pro a sanctification process. Uh, this is not only are you, are you will be defended by the Almighty against your enemies, but he also will sanctify you as you continue to follow his ways, which is what Job has been talking about this whole time, which is what Job has been defending himself against his fellow kings this whole time. They keep claiming that he he must be covering up his sin. And Job keeps saying, guys, I haven't. I've, I do not walk with the unrighteous. I'm, I walk righteously. Mm -hmm. I follow the ways of the Father. We're actually going to read a very specific passage about that here in just a minute. But he, uh, he, this is the defense he keeps making, and he's actually explaining the sanctification process, which is his discipleship. Yeah. And the, the Masoretic makes it look like you're just going to get rich. I know. Yeah, that's, that's how it reads to me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, Job was making sacrifices for his sons in case in case they had sinned before the Lord during their banquets. I mean, he was he was trying to cover all all grounds, right? Just righteously wanting to make sure that all aspects of his life and those associated with him, you know, were were covered through righteousness. That's right. Oh. So, yeah. yeah. So then here in chapter 23, 11 through 12, my foot has held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone backward back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The Septuagint compares it with, and I will go forth according to his commandments, for I have kept his ways, and I shall not turn aside from his commandments, neither shall I transgress, but I have hidden his words in my bosom. Okay. I love that. I love it, man. It's so clear. It's not about just the word, the commandment of his lips or the words of his mouth, right? Mm-hmm. It's literally saying, like it's saying transgression of commandments and his ways are all uh, contextually linked. And this is what he hid in his bosom. So you guys remember a few passages earlier, we talked about all has been fulfilled to me in my bosom, mm -hmm. right? Well, because you can be confident, guys. I'm going to, let me put this, let me put our faces on screen. You can be confident of your salvation. You can be confident of your future resurrection if you keep his ways. You have a high priest who's faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Just therefore confess and repent your sin, practice his behavior. You can be confident that you will be raised to eternal life, just yeah. as Job was, just as Abraham was, just as Noah, Shem, all the way back to Adam, just as Paul and the disciples and anybody else in that time period. You can be confident of this. Do not let modern Christianity tell you that you have to live in this fear and not be sure that you will be resurrected. You can be 100% confident. It doesn't mean you're arrogant about it. It doesn't mean that you're you know, acting silly, you still walk it out with respect to the father through fear and trembling. But at the same time, you can be sure and confident that he will resurrect you from the dead. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen, brother. I know it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you question, I don't know. I have throughout my life and throughout my journey and my walk is like, am I going to attain the resurrection? Am I, am I worthy enough to, you know, be called out on the day of the Lord and, and take on an immortal body. Am I doing enough? Am I saying enough? Am I sinning too much? What you just said there is great. And we need to, we need to keep that in mind that part of being in covenant and having a relationship with the father and the son um, requires having confidence and, and knowing that you are a son and daughter of the father. You, yeah. you are, you know, you we, are. We are, that, that's Sean's, I mean, the, the priesthood was there because we are faulty and, and we make mistakes and it, it covers all grounds. It just, it's not to be abused, right? but it's there and it's put in place for us to know that even amidst our, our issues and our flawed nature, we can have the confidence that one day we will have the law of God written on our hearts when the new covenant comes and we won't have to do that anymore. And we're striving to do that now while we're in this corrupted body that we have. Right. So just, That's right. yeah. So th there's a guy that came up to Jesus and he asked, he wanted to be confident of this as well. And it's here in Matthew 19. And he says to him, he says, and someone came to him and said, teacher, what good thing shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why are you asking me what is good? There's only one who's good. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Like this is an open book test, fellas and ladies. <laughs> If you, you're asking the big question, how do I get to eternal life? Which means you live forever in the new Jerusalem with the father and the son, and the angels, and you can have, you know, paradise, right? You can live forever. And he, he tells you the answer. 
it's it's in the story. It's it's all the way back to Leviticus eighteen five and Genesis twenty two and Genesis eighteen. But if you want it like with no minced words, if you want it directly spoken to you, we have the example in Scripture of Matthew nineteen. The guy asks, "How do I get eternal life?" Specifically connected to an action. Mm-hmm. How do I? What good thing do I do? Right? Is it just simply to believe? Well, he already believed Jesus. He's sitting there talking to him. Yeah. He's asking for his advice. <laughs> Right. He believes who Jesus is and what is going on. And so he asked the great teacher, what do I do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. And all Jesus is doing is repeating Leviticus 18 or Ezekiel 20 or some other Deuteronomy 4. He's just repeating the Torah. It's not it's not Jesus isn't making this up on the spot. He's just repeating the scriptures that are already there. It's literally an open book test, guys. You can be confident. You can be confident. Exactly. And he's not he's not abrogating anything from the definition that it always has been the same definition that we see job saying that he kept he keeps the commandments right he he knows the father's law and keeps it close to his bosom that's right so. that's right brother let me go back here to the to the slides real quick all right so the next one Sorry, 24, 24 11 okay which make oil within their walls and tread their wine presses and suffer thirst and the Septuagint compares it with, they have unrighteously laid weight in narrow places and have not known the righteous way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Word Very different. That, that we need to understand the definitions for. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this is also someone that is not doing the way of the commandments, like Job has already talked about. And the Masoretic makes it look, I have no clue what the Masoretic is talking about. Yeah. I, I had no idea either. <laughs> Having some of the surrounding verses to help with the context even still doesn't doesn't really to doesn't. me make sense, but no, it doesn't, guys. Um so Job 25 3. <clears throat> okay, so we, sorry, before we jump on that, Sean, there's a question in the chat why Dave Lewis there. He's asking if we believe the Holy Spirit was created or always was with the Father. That's I mean, that's another topic on another episode but i mean both sean and i we've we've briefly discussed that the the holy spirit is the animating force coming from the father it's his breath it's his life that he can breathe and animate into people um that's his power uh, to do things and and to to you know get men and prophets and and believers uh to doing his ways and and so it's not it's not a created entity um or, you know, a third person of a Trinity. It's literally the father's animating force's breath. That's right. Yeah. It's Genesis two, seven. It is, it is also what Ecclesiastes, what is it? Nine, six, you know, the, the spirit goes back to, to whom him who gave it. It's that breath of life is considered the spirit of God, the pneuma uh, in the, in the Greek new Testament. But it's like Ken said, it's animating breath. It's not, there is no scripture in any of the texts that we've compared and studied and analyzed and critiqued. There's no scripture that tells you the Holy Spirit is a separate character that does different things. It's just the power that flows through the Father and the Son. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so Job 25, 3, Masoretic. Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom does not his light arise? And the Septuagint compares with, For let none think there is a respite for robbers, and upon whom will not that, um, upon whom will there not come a snare from him? So to me, this is very different, <laughs> very different. Yeah, it is. It's very. Yeah. Very one's just talking about there's no rest for those who are doing wicked acts and there will become that, you know, God will snare him, you know, um, which means get him caught up in his sin and in, tra- in his own sin will entrap him. Whereas the Masoretic, I, I'm not sure exactly what it's talking about. Yeah. It's another one of those things that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the other, you know? Yeah, it's really different. And in fact, this is 25.3. Or what, what verse is this? 25.3, yeah. Um, it, you know, it's it's very interesting. I'm not, I'm, this is actually Bill Dad uh, or Bull Dad talking as well. So this is one of the other kings or the sovereign, I should say, that's talking. This is another word for king. So, so I'm not exactly sure. But he, again, he's he's repeating a concept from Torah. Whereas the Masoretic text is is not, I don't know exactly what it's talking about or repeating or alluding to, but the Septuagint is repeating a concept from Torah. Like there is no rest from the wicked. Okay, you you will be found out by your sins. Those are Proverbs and Psalms, but also the idea that 
you know, you will be ensnared in your sin as Leviticus 26, you know, 20 through 45, it talks about. So, yeah, one's talking a Torah principle, the other one's really vague. So it's interesting difference. Mm -hmm. Job 26, 5, dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. The Septuagint compares it with, shall giants be born from under the water and the inhabitants thereof? So we got <laughs> dead things and giants. Okay. Interesting. Who are the giants, Sean? Where do they come from? These giants is a Greek word translated from the Nephala, the Nephilim, from the original Hebrew. And that's going to be the deceitful, unclean spirits who were the spirits that came from the giants from before the flood. Which is very interesting. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, it just seems to be two different. I mean, it's specifically saying, I guess if this was the Greek, it would have been what? Gigantis, Gigantis, whatever that word is in the Greek. Yeah be born from under the water and this is just dead things are formed from under the waters so yeah very, i mean very interesting it's not i mean dead things giants who became unclean spirits upon their their death their bodily death are technically dead things but are still alive because they're unclean spirits so i don't know there could be a little leeway there but i think the Septuagint's a little more interesting just how it's worded um i'm trying to i'm looking at the 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 surrounding verses in the Septuagint passage. Um, in fact, if you give me just a second, this is Job talking. I'm going to, sorry guys, one second. I want to put this on screen for us. Um, this is, this is the part here. Job answered and said, to whom do you, to whom do you attach yourself or whom are you going to assist? Is it not he that has much strength and he who has a strong arm to whom has have you given counsel? It is not him who has all wisdom. Is it not to him who has all wisdom? Whom will you follow? Is it not one who has the greatest power? So these are rhetorical questions. This is very common in Hebrew literature. They ask a bunch of rhetorical questions and answer them. Um, verse four says, to whom have you uttered words and whose breath is it that has come forth from you? Again, an allusion back to the previous chapter that this breath is the spirit of God that, that comes through you. And then he says, shall giants be born from under the water and the inhabitants thereof? Hell is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. He stretches out the north upon. The, we're actually going to see the north wind. This Hell would be a, Hades, right? Verse six, just so people understand. That's yeah. Hades this would be naked before him because it's the Greek. Yes, it's this would be cool. Hades. Yeah. Yeah. So is it? So do you think this is just like a, um, like a rhetorical kind of like when it's saying, "Shall giants be born from under the water and the inhabitants thereof?" I mean, no. No, they're not because, I mean, could this be alluding to the resurrection? I and mean, we don't have to go on on a huge thing. We just we want to pick up the differences. But I'm just trying to understand, even just in the Septuagint version here, is this is this kind of just saying like, shall giants be born? Well, no, not giants. Human right. beings were born from under the water, right? That's right. That's right. So it's a it's a like a what's the way? It's like a sarcastic mention of what's promised of mankind, the resurrection, that we shall be birthed from Sheol which is under the waters of the earth and the heart of the earth, but, um, but not giants, but not, not the unclean spirits. It's kind of like an inverted way, a, re a re sarcastic rhetorical way of referring to something that's not going to happen because it is going to happen to us. Those who follow the commandments, if that makes any sense. So, all right, cool. All right, brother. Um, we'll go to the next one real quick. Job 26, seven. Okay, I like this one. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangs the earth upon nothing. And the Septuagint compares it with, he stretches out the north wind upon nothing and he upon nothing hangs the earth. Interesting. Yeah, the north wind. Yeah. Instead of the north over the empty place. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, it's like a cosmological reference, right? Yeah. And this is one that actually gets taken, in my opinion, kind of completely out of context to support a heliocentric, you know, the, the nothing, the globe, it's not on anything, right? It's just spinning through nothingness. So there we go. Heliocentrism right here. Job knew about it. No, that's, that's not what actually what's being promoted. But yeah. It's so not. What, what's this North wind upon nothing, Sean? What, what do you think the significance of mentioning this, the wind or the pneuma, what it would be in the Greek? Um, well, this, we actually see this, I think it's in Enoch uh, chapter 
oh man, I want to say 75 or 76. Right. Where he talks creation up with these winds, right? Yeah, there's the these multiple winds that that run through creation that are a part of creation that angels are actually in charge of. And uh, there's these different portals and gates and all the weather patterns come throughout these portals and gates. There's 12 of them. Um, and this is a part of the actual firmament. This is where, from which the wind comes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a part of the uh, air circulation system, if you will, of, of the big firmament enclosed room that we live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Okay. Job 26, 13. By his spirit, he has garnished the heavens. His hand has formed the crooked serpent. All right, and the Septuagint compares it with, and the berries of heaven fear him, and by a command he has slain the apostate dragon. Hmm. This is more, interesting. Okay, so we got some more creation model uh, terminology here, along with a dimension of, what, a crooked serpent or an apostate dragon. I mean, what's why, why are we <laughs> highlighting this? This is interesting to me. Right, this is interesting. Um, what do you think the apostate dragon is? Well, as we know, Satan, um, he's got many names. I mean, it's, it's the, the crooked serpent, dragon, um, you know, Mastema, Azazel, aside from his monikers, um, to call him a serpent and dragon is, is not incorrect, but it's just interesting that it's, it's talking about an apostate dragon. Right. That's right. And one says he's formed him. The other one says he's slain him. Mm hmm the other one says he's garnished the heavens, which is the firmament model of creation. The other one says the barriers of heaven fear him. Barriers. This is, yeah, this is talking about uh, him in this passage being um, specifically the, the the Almighty. Yeah. In Joe twenty six thirteen, because this is uh, it's it's not talking about the dragon. The barriers of heaven don't fear, fear the dragon. It's that they fear the Almighty, and by a command, he the Almighty has slain the apostate dragon, which is something that's promised of going to happen at the after the end of the millennial rain yeah exactly you know so it's very interesting one is that it's like describing how the heavens have been garnished compared to how the barriers of heaven fear him mm -hmm. why would the barriers of heaven fear the almighty because i think they know that in order to accomplish slaying the dragon it, it requires them to shake and that's to right. be refashioned in a way, right? But so that's I true. love how it's using this the barriers. I mean, that's that's giving us a, a literal description of something that's tangible, actual, that has boundaries. Yep. Right. As opposed to just this, he's just garnishing the heavens, right? He's just making whatever. Like he's, yeah. I, I just like how it's worded here. It's interesting. Yeah, it is, because also if you had this translation this whole time, we we may have a more better description of the creation model and not have fallen so easily for you know, this occultic heliocentric model mm -hmm. and slaying the apostate dragon. We know that, that mm -hmm. Satan, Azazel had, he, he left his, his first abode and, and decided to essentially war against the father. He was, I mean, he was created to, to praise the father and to keep the commandments and the law. And he decided to, you know, rebel against that. So that makes him apostate and that it is, it's, it's worded quite a bit different here in terms of slaying him. Mm -hmm which is a future event as, and forming a crooked serpent. Right. You know I mean, it's just, it leaves out that important detail that this apostate dragon is going to be receiving some punishment, which was foreordained in the book of Enoch and, and other places. Right, Sean? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's a couple different places. Um, chapter 30, verse 23. Okay. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. And the Septuagint compares it with, for I know that death will destroy me, for the earth is the house appointed for every mortal. Oh, sorry about that. So yeah, I th this one sounds very similar. It does. But it's interesting to me because it talks about, one is that you will bring me to death. Two is it, it, the Septuagint says that death will destroy me. So it's it's a, it's a little bit different there about the, the causality of the death, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then the earth is the house appointed for every mortal, whereas and to the house appointed for all living. Yeah. So it it's to me it, it's it, it, it calls gives you a much place. right. And what we've been talking about when we talk about creation model stuff that the father placed us on the on level number one mm -hmm. of this big house that he created with multiple ceilings above right. called firmaments or heavens. That's right. So, and in death, the heart of the earth 
mm-hmm. which is an enclosed area, yeah. is referred to here as like a house appointed for everyone who dies. So this is this is another idea of you know not to the house above in heaven appointed for all living, but to the house below in the earth appointed for all living who have died. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's I guess I just want to point out because it can cause people to think of this common, um, this common thought and teaching that was prevalent through the Catholic Church during the same time the Masoretic was created, which is this idea that you, if you're righteous, if you're good, and you're saved by Christ, you just go straight to heaven when you die. Yeah. as opposed to going to the heart of the earth into Sheol and waiting for your resurrection, like the scriptures yeah. te- te- teach us. So just something I want to point out. No, it's worth noting. Absolutely. Okay. So oh, sorry. Here we go. Job 33, four. All right. Masoretic says the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. And the Septuagint compares it with the divine spirit is that which formed me and the breath of the Almighty, that which teaches me. Interesting. So yeah. we have the breath of the Almighty giving him life, which is true. That's true. That is true. That's not an incorrect or inaccurate theological position here, but right. the highlighted version, Almighty that which teaches me through the right. breath. Hmm. So we got the, is this, you think this is a reference of the Holy Spirit teaching through Job here? Well, this is it even in Job talking. In this chapter, it's Elihu talking. Or Elihu. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This yeah. is the this is that fourth kid that showed up that was younger than everybody else and wanted to get his words in last. So this is Elihu talking, and he also claims uh, to be taught by the Spirit of God, which is something you see this type of phraseology in the New Testament, right? Mm-hmm. That you'll have the Spirit of God to teach you all things. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, so I know we I, I always always taught growing up that these these individuals, these companions of Job, or you know, companions were just kind of antagonizers, people who just came to like pick and prod at him, who likely weren't believers at all or anything, or were likely pagan even, right? And here we yeah. have completely different details and descriptions of who these guys actually were and are. That's right. It's very, very revealing, much more context to all this. Yeah. All right, Job 33, 27 to 30 says, He looks upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things work God, oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. Hmm. And the Septuagint compares it with, Even then a man shall blame himself, saying, What kind of things have I done? And he has not punished me according to the full amount of my sins. Deliver my soul, that it may not go to destruction, and my life shall see the light. Behold, all these things the Mighty One works in a threefold manner with the man. And he has delivered my soul from death, that my life may praise him in the light. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Yeah. He has not punished me according to the full amount of my sins. Hmm. Particular word there too. I mean, my... My interest is always piqued when I see the word sin being used, especially in a pre uh, synatic context. Right. 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 Yeah. So this guy is, he, he's acknowledging a, a, a sense of mercy here that's been shown to him. Mm-hmm. And it's not just simply that he did what was perverted and wrong and it profited him not. It's that he realizes as he's repenting and confessing, that he's not going to get the full punishment that his sins deserve. This is the beauty of God's Torah enacted through a priest for you to create atonement for you. Right. So that you don't get what you deserve, right? That you would escape the punishment um, and therefore have your sin atoned for through forgiveness. So this is a, a very unique concept that this guy is discussing. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Yeah. And then the last part there, and he has delivered my soul from death that my life may praise him in the light. So what's the significance of that? I mean, is this an allusion to the resurrection? Is this kind of like a, a proleptic statement in your opinion? Yeah, this this is definitely, in my opinion, and it actually is very similar to the Masoretic. So I want to be as fair as possible, the Masoretic claiming that to bring back um, his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living, that would be in a, a synonym for being resurrected. And But the, the Septuagint puts it in a way to that is more consistent with Psalm 49, where every soul who sins that dies goes to the pit, goes to death, which is Sheol, Abaddon, Hades. Um, It goes to 
the, the heart of the earth to this place prepared for it. And that's where you're delivered from, physically delivered from as your resurrected body is pulled from the heart of the earth. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the part where it just gives you more context to the consistency of the promise of the covenant, which is resurrection for those who believe. And so I, it's not vague. And again, this is um, Elihu speaking. Yeah. So he, he even knows the storyline, this, this Elihu guy who's not Job and he's not, you know what I'm saying? So I just think that that's fascinating to me. Um, and what do you think, brother? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's super fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like these other guys had had an understanding of the resurrection. Like they had, they they knew what the, it meant to be in covenant. They they knew what like the word sin has the context, right? Anytime you see the word sin, it has to do with breaking God's commandments, His law. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, these other individuals in the story um, had full knowledge of what God's law was, and that you can break it, and that there is, uh, as Sean was saying, a priesthood that can help atone for your sin and ultimately through Yeshua create a resurrection um, experience for you. And they, they clearly got that this was part of being in covenant that they would be resurrected and praise him in the light. So it's, it's mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah. And there's, it, there's actually a, a contrasting parallel here. I didn't include in this chapter um, just to let you know that we're talking about a guy who's under, he's speaking covenant language. He's speaking, resurrection language he knows the story that is the promise of the covenant um this is not one of the three kings this is additional friend of 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 job that's in the in the story that decides to start speaking up at this point it doesn't tell you that he's a king but it does tell you what's unique about it is that uh the the masoretic doesn't tell you where he's from but the uh, septuagint does tell you where he's from and actually just give me one second can i'll put this on screen yeah do that um so this is the guy talking here. It's Elias or Elihu, um, the son of Barakiel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram of the country of Ossis. And if you guys want to put in the chat, if y'all know where the country of Ossis is, because this part right here of the country of Ossis has been taken out of the Masoretic. So yeah. you don't see it. You don't see it in the Masoretic anywhere. So I don't know what, what um, that word is or what that word means or what country that's supposed to represent because it's the Greek transliteration. So this is one I just, I didn't actually have a good answer for, but if anyone in the chat knows, please, please put it in the chat or put it in the comment section. Yeah, that would be very interesting to know. But clearly he's not of the Israelites. He's not of, he's not in Goshen. He's not from Goshen because at this point right now, all the descendants of Jacob are in Goshen. So this is someone else just in some other some other land who knows the story of the covenant and of the resurrection and is trying to reprimand Job because he thinks Job is hiding his sin. Yeah. <laughs> so they're all talking about covenant language. They're all talking about sinning against the Almighty, transgressing and receiving just penalty for it, which is what they're blaming Job for. They, they're accusing Job of receiving penalty from the Lord because he had been in sin, which means the whole context of all these guys who are not any any of none of these four dudes or five dudes are a part of the descendancy of Jacob. They're all outside of Israel and they're, and they're walking in the ways of Yahweh and the almighty. How amazing is that guys? That is amazing. Very amazing. In, in fact, we're going to read something extremely controversial at the end of the Septuagint that tells us exactly who Job is from. Yeah. At the end of this uh, book of Job and the Septuagint. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So what do you think, brother? Do you want to, you want to do another one or do you, do you want to put a bookmark here and get back to it? Cause it, it looks like we're going to be doing another episode for sure. Uh, let me see. Where are we here? We're on number what thirty? Yeah, you know what? We better because the last part of this is going to be huge. Um, yeah. we, we've we've got like another fifteen to go, but like the last several of these are so big, especially when it starts talking about Leviathan and then also where Job is from and all that. So, yeah, we would just be rushing it today. Yeah, we'll we'll probably leave you on that cliffhanger. Um, yeah. Join us for the next installment of uh, testing the book of Job, Greek Septuagint versus the Masoretic text. You're going to not want to miss next week's episode for sure, because as yeah. I said, there's some really interesting things that are actually going to transition into another book that we're going to be covering that we're really excited to bring forward to you guys as well. So please join us for that. We appreciate your questions. Sean, I didn't see any other question. Oh, I, actually, there was another question from Chico. He asked about what is, I think we where was a what a soul is. Did I see that right? Uh, let me see here. Oh, yeah. Here it is, 1985. 
Yeah, what is the soul? So, I mean, briefly, it, the soul is Genesis 2 7, right? Mm -hmm. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul or living creature. So we have the dust, which is the, the physical, tangible, you know, material of the earth, and then the father breathing, right? His spirit breathing the breath which is that's the word in, in the greek it's pneuma um and ruach in the hebrew and so he's breathing it into this dust that he's just formed out of the earth and it becomes a living soul mm -hmm. which is important to note because a lot of people say that we have a soul um when technically we are a soul and and when we die as as solomon talks about in ecclesiastes the spirit goes back to the father so that animating breath that the father breathed into the dirt goes back to him the dirt we know goes you no know, goes, goes back into the ground and decomposes but then what we were once we became when once that union happened needs to go somewhere which isn't really taught much in in my experience of christianity um right. Because of missing books like First Enoch, not in your Bible, and, uh, and other things, and taking things out of context. But where we go, as Sean said, you know, we don't go to heaven when we die. We go to Sheol because we were a soul that's wrapped in this flesh. So that's that's kind of the the brief of it. Um, it's a huge topic. We've talked about it. I have videos uh, that I've done. Sean's done videos on it too. Yeah, and I think Chico's follow up statement to that question was, I think he's having trouble understanding Matthew ten twenty eight, where Yeshua says, "Do not fear those who can just kill the body and not the soul, but fear God who can kill both the body and the soul in the lake of fire." Mm -hmm. um, now, most English translations will say hell in that spot, but if you look up the original Greek, it's the word Gehenna, which is the word for the lake of fire, yeah. um, and that's what he's trying to say there. And that's what happens is, like Ken said, your body dies, the the experiences of your life, which you'll be judged by, you know, your, your memories, your emotions, your, your, the essence that was created as a result of the union of his spirit and this dirt, that, that, that essence remains. And that's what has to get put back into a physical body. That's, it's like your, you know, your, well, if I could use a modern, you know, computer term, you know, your, your hard drive information is, is backed up to the cloud. <laughs> right. And that goes somewhere, even though your physical computer is dead. And though it's that information you put back into a brand new device that lives forever. But at the same time, it's, that's the same information you're judged by, right? That's your experiences through life, your decisions, your, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Um, so this is, this is the soul that is, if you aren't given eternal life, well, then you're given the lake of fire, which means both your body and your soul, that essence of experiences will both be destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, you no longer get backed up by the cloud at that point. Yeah, it's like the movie Transcend. Was it Transcendence with Johnny Depp? You know how I don't think I saw that one. Okay, well, in the movie, it, they're trying to ex essentially do what transhumanism is trying to attempt by year twenty forty five. Look into it, brothers and sisters, if you haven't heard of it, the twenty forty five initiative, where they want to be able to extract the human consciousness and put it into a machine so that it can live forever. That's what the Father has offered us through his means of creating us into an immortal body, right? So he puts our consciousness, our soul into a, a holding cell and then he can remove it and put us into an immortal body his way, right? And that's, that's right. what the transhumanism movement is trying to attempt without him. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, yeah, it's, it reminds me of that. There's an old movie from the 70s called Logan's Run is either the 70s or early 80s. And it was about this dystopian society in the future that was uh, ran by these elites. And, the, and like they chose people through this lottery system to die, but they didn't tell them they were going to die. They told them that they were going to be like, I guess, reincarnated or something. And they would like take them to this arena where they would be like elevated into the air. They would like anti-gravity. They would be like sucked up into the air and then they'd be shot with lasers and vaporized. And they told them that they're you know, their souls would go back. If I can remember this right, their souls would go back into the new babies that were being born. So that, that way could they do population control with their limited resources in this futuristic society. But um, they also, cho you know, you were special if you were chosen to be reborn, right? Okay. But literally they're just killing people. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's a very dystopian world. And that to me, Ken, that's the way I see this promise of transhumanism is that they, they claim they can take your soul out of your physical body, keep it alive and put it into something else. But as far as I understand, only God can do that. Only the father, only the yeah. father can do that. So that's a huge lie from the enemy that's coming. 
because when they claim to take you to a procedure to extract your consciousness and put it into a different computer or Android body or whatever, so that you can live forever. Now you're going to, you're just, you'll just wake up and Sheol. <laughs> when you go in for that procedure, you'll just wake up and Sheol and some AI or some unclean spirit will be animating that uh, Android type body instead of you. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. If people would just acquiesce to the father's ways and, and, and just, understand what is promised to them if they could just repent and and go into covenant with him and trust in in his means of attaining that type of immortality that they so desire right then it would just be so much simpler <laughs> it would yeah it would okay guys thank you so much for for joining us this evening i don't think we got any more questions up here sean so um, we got one last question from the vacationers and it, date the life of jacob around the year 3500 bc obviously yeah. um why do they that's where they land i suppose I, I'll, I'll have to look into that i haven't yeah. told i'm guessing them. the vacationers is asking because he's he's done uh the the math on some of the timelines from genesis 5 and genesis uh, 11 but we've talked about this previously how the septuagint and the Masoretic they both have very different timeline estimations for the lifespans of the patriarchs listed in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. Yeah. Hundreds of years of discrepancy, right? Yeah. yeah. Each each person is like 100 years off uh, as far as how long they lived before they started having kids. So Even in this we, book that we're testing tonight, we're going to yeah. get to the next episode. There's a discrepancy yeah. in each differences. So, Yeah. Remember, guys, it's this is why we're testing it. It's, it's hard to discern which one has the most accurate information. So this is why we, we've never said at any point in this conversation tonight that you should disregard the Masoretic. We didn't say that. Mm -hmm. We said you should test both of them. That's what we're doing in front of you. There, there are some things, there are a few places in the New Testament where um, the, uh, the disciples and Yeshua, they quote from the Masoretic, but from the most, most of the time they quote from the Septuagint. Now, as we also said in the introduction tonight, there are multiple Septuagints that were created after the original was created. Mm -hmm. And there could have been some scribal errors. There could have been some change in, in things, even as far as the age of people. Um, there could have been some tampering as well. This is, again, this is why we compare these live for you to watch us do this. And why we've said throughout all this, it's the context, which is what's most important. Even though all these different translations, there are minor different differences. And some of them, some what what you and I can consider a minor difference. Some people might think is a major difference, right? Yes. Like yeah. how long did Abraham live before he started having Isaac, right? So with that concept, we have to keep in mind and remember that the overall story doesn't change. So there are scribal translation errors that have been discovered over time, and this is why they make new translations. Mm -hmm. There are differences in how words translate into other languages, which sometimes causes two different translations. So just keep in mind, the overall story has not changed. Your promise of redemption, you're created by God. He's got a one and only begotten son. There's angels that serve all of them. You know what I'm saying? Like all the basics are still there. And even the, some of the advanced concepts are still there. Yeah. So we're just dealing with the issues of translation over time. And this is one of the things we look at here in Honor of Kings. Yeah, absolutely. And as Sean's covered in videos on his channel over at Kingdom in Context, go, go subscribe, guys. Go like his videos, watch them, share them. He's just he's talked about how the uh, the lying pens of the scribes and, and Judaism has tampered with the Septuagint. I mean, if you pull up some of the the church fathers, quote unquote, mm -hmm. they discuss how things were in the Septuagint that they removed, but then when we refer to the our current Septuagint versions, they're not even in there. Right. So it's like they ha things have things. They're not in the Masoretic either. Yeah. And they're not Masoretic either. So it's like our versions of the Septuagint right now aren't even the originals. The originals, likely what Yeshua and Paul and all of them were quoting from, even though we have a good majority of the same information that they had. It's just stuff has been moved around, tampered with. And so that's the unfortunate thing about it. Um, but yeah, don't don't be disparaged, don't be despondent. Like we still, as Sean has tried to iterate emphatically throughout this uh, episode that we have the word um, and we have the context of the word through all the different passages to, to formulate in our minds the gospel message of the kingdom of God, which no amount of tampering can take away. I mean, it's it's there. 
it is there and it's evident and uh just rely on that the fact that it, all the message is, is still there and you can understand it ken real quick uh John Padilla has got a good question from some of the things we've said tonight. And this is this, we do need to clear this up. So what we were talking about, John, we were saying how he's asking, how could the quote from the Meser, how could they, and he's talking about people in the new Testament, how could they quote from the Masoretic if the Masoretic text did not exist until after they lived? Mm -hmm. Right. What well, we're talking about the Masoretic text was he, the Hebrew of the eighth and ninth century AD, the rabbinic Pharisees translating into Hebrew, what they had already had from the Septuagint from the Greek. OK, so that means there were still accurate places that they translated. They didn't change. So that's why when you would see something quoted from the Greek New Testament letters and, and Gospels, there would still be accuracy from the things being quoted from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and different places. The Masoretic, the Masoretic scholars or rabbinic Pharisees didn't change everything. So they, they transpose some things properly, but there are some differences. And that's the differences is what we're covering. I hope that's a, a, a decent explanation for you, brother. Yeah, I, that was good. So, but it's a great question. Yeah. I, I'm sorry if we made that confusing the way we described it. But it's this is why I said at the beginning of the show, guys, we gave you a very, very brief breakdown. There's some people, guys, that had dedicate literally entire YouTube channels to just explaining the, the, the history of the texts of, of Scripture. Because there's so, we we try to include a little bit of that as we talk, and we do, sometimes do it with slides. And, you know, as we go through these these books, but we're giving you like a surface level because we're trying to get to the text, mm -hmm. but there's other channels out there that they, that's all they do is go over all the historicity of where these texts came from and how many different translations and who translated it and who commissioned it. And, and it's its own literal study in college course. Yeah. We're giving you the high, the cliff notes right now. We're doing our best because otherwise these would be three hour lectures and you'll be super boring. <laughs> so we're, you know, just, there's a lot more than what we're showing you. You have to do your own diligence, do your own study on, uh, but we try to give you at least enough to whet your appetite. Exactly. And please do that. Please test please do that. Talk about on, on these shows and on our channels and uh, come to your, so your own conclusions and prayerfully consider, you know, the content that we do put out, but, but definitely be Bereans and study the words for yourself and do your own yeah. research because that's, that's your responsibility. And uh, we all have that responsibility as believers in the father. So do it. Yeah. And also, Hit the like button on this video if you don't mind. Share it if it you know blessed you. Um, leave a comment if you guys are watching after we've gone live. Um, about yep. whatever you want, negative, positive, whatever you want. Just be active so we can get this yep. stuff out, out into the interwebs and uh, into people's hands so they can they can join the conversation and, and the study as well. That's right, bro. We'll be back. I think next week, Sean, if all goes well. Uh, to do part two for, for the book of Job, Septuagint versus the Masoretic text. And we got a lot of interesting stuff to cover. If today yeah. was interesting, which I think it was, I think there's a lot of good stuff we covered. Next week's episode will be, it'll blow your socks off where we're going with it. So <laughs> <laughs> next week, love you guys. See you guys later. My name is Ken Heidebrook. My heart's desire here at Hanging On His Words is to spread the entirety of the gospel message to whoever will hear it and to serve my creator by helping people learn how to be obediently in covenant with him. Hanging On His Words is a ministry that not only teaches others how to run this faith race, but does so through compelling video and musical content. If you are someone that has personally been blessed by my music or video teachings or both, Please consider contributing to my efforts. My goals are to step up my music and video production value, and more importantly, to create content on a more frequent and full-time basis. This is where you, you, yes, you, my patrons can make this possible. Whether your support is financial or through prayers and encouragement, I just wanted to say thank you very much.